Greetings and welcome to Berkeley Conversations COVID-19. I'm Dan Mogala from UC Berkeley's Office of Communications and Public Affairs. Today we've assembled an excellent panel of experts who will be talking about the growing economic impacts of the crisis, the government's responses to date and ideas for additional action that will almost certainly be needed in the future. I'm joined today by five faculty members from the Goldman School of Public Policy. The recording this meeting is being Berkeley's recorded. Economics Department. Henry Brady is Dean of the Golden School of Public Policy and a professor of public policy and political science. He is a veteran of the federal government's Office of Management and Budget and has written extensively on the political economy and social welfare policy. Hillary Hoynes is a professor of public policy and economics and holds the Haas Distinguished Chair in Economic Disparities. Her research focuses on poverty and inequality and she serves on Governor Gavin Newsom's Council of Economic Advisors. Gabriel Zuckman is Associate Professor of Economics and Director of the James M. and Catherine D. Stone Center on Wealth and Income Equality. His research focuses on the accumulation, distribution, and taxation of global wealth. Alora Derenincourt is an incoming Assistant Professor of Economics and Public Policy. Welcome to Berkeley. Uh, her research focuses on labor market institutions, economic history, and inequality. And finally, Jesse Rothstein is a professor of public policy and economics. He previously served as chief economist at the U.S. Department of Labor and as senior economist with the Council of Economic Advisors, both in the Obama administration. Jesse, let's stick with you. Um, those unemployment numbers that have captured the headlines and have only added to the, I think, fears and uncertainties that people have are stunning. They're being called unprecedented, dramatic. Unpack the data. What story is being told? Were you surprised that a six and a half, 6.6 .6 million additional people joined the unemployment rolls? Help us through this. Yeah, it's, it's enormous. It is unprecedented. We've never seen anything like this that's anywhere near this rapid. And even aside from the rapidity, we've never in my lifetime or any of our lifetimes seen anything like this. Uh, this is going to be the deepest hit to the labor market that we've that we've seen since the Great Depression. There are it's probably not too surprising that when you tell the economy to shut down, that the economy shuts down. Uh, and what we've learned is that there are, in fact, a lot of workers who can't work remotely. And so if you tell their businesses that they can't come in and the customers can't come to the businesses, then the people then people are out of jobs. Uh, and so it's in, in incredibly important that we make sure that we get aid to people to keep them afloat during this time and that we get get aid to the businesses to keep those businesses afloat so that the people have jobs to come back to when, when, they, when we let them do that. Jesse, let me stick with you here for a second and bring it down to a human level. You're a veteran of, of economics. You've been around for a while. Do you ever think you'd see anything like this? No. I, when I worked in the White House in 2009 and 10, I thought that was the most exciting time ever to be working on labor economics. <laughs> and it's got, and unfortunately, it, I was wrong. Um, and so I, I never imagined anything like this. And I don't think anybody did. So let me open it up a little bit now. I want to ask each of you the same question. Um, and Alora, I want to start with you and then we'll go around. From your vantage point, from your specialty, in terms of your expertise, what are the most significant economic developments you're seeing now and tracking and what story are they telling you? So I'm a historical labor economist and we, as Jesse pointed out, haven't seen a crisis of this scale since the 1930s and 1940s. And we already had vast inequality leading into this moment, and now it's widening into something we haven't seen in recent history. So for particular groups in the US, um, I think their experience really captures the depth of this tragedy and its dual economic and medical nature. So I'm thinking of Black Americans, uh, Latino Americans, low-wage workers, so based on the fragmentary data that we have coming out of New York City, Black and Latino Americans are dying at twice the rate from COVID-19 as white Americans. And layer on top of that, the economic burden. So Jesse pointed out, most Americans can't work from home. That's even more true of uh, Black and Latino workers. And uh, so they're really bearing the, the brunt of this, of this crisis. 
we're going to come back to inequality, inequities and disparities that have really, this crisis is shining a harsh light on. But let me continue going around here. Um, Hillary, let me turn. Let me turn to you. What are you seeing? What story is being told? Yeah. So you know, as Jesse summarized, we have this unprecedented period of time where we've got these increases that are showing up through the unemployment claims. And what we know is that the numbers that we've seen so far don't even tell the whole story of the number of people who have experienced reductions in earnings. So we know that not everybody ends up on the unemployment claims uh, due to lack of eligibility uh, uh, and other factors. And what we know more generally is that economic recessions always hit disadvantaged workers more disproportionately than advantaged workers. So we know that those with lower education, lower skill levels, lower wage levels tend to be harmed more when the economy enters a recession. And we have every reason to believe that the same is true in the current situation, perhaps much more so than is typical as Laura mentioned around the fact that many workers are not able to work from home, all of us involved in this, in this event are able to work from home. And so we expect these disparities to be much greater in the current crisis. And as we talk today, I think it's gonna be very important to discuss what actions have already been taken by Congress and how, you know, my view is that the most disadvantaged in, in America are currently uh, really being left out a lot of the activity that has taken place to date. And yes, we're certainly gonna to get to an analysis and discussion of governmental actions to date. Gabe, let me turn to you and ask also, cause I know you have some specialization in sort of global issues, broaden our horizons a little bit, talking not just about what you're seeing here nationally, but also on a global scale. Yeah, when, I mean, one thing that strikes me is that uh, the way that the U.S. is responding to the, to the crisis uh, is quite different than what you're seeing in other countries. The unemployment rate is rising very fast right now in the U.S. Millions of jobs are being destroyed. In most other countries, governments try to protect uh, jobs. That is, what they do is they have uh, payroll protection programs or short time work programs where workers remain formally employed. Uh, their employers keep paying them their, their, their normal wage. And uh, the government then reimburses the uh, employers uh, for that wage, you know, sometimes up to 100%, like in Norway, or sometimes, you know, 75%, like in the UK. 80% or 90% like in France. Um, and so what you're seeing in those countries is that unemployment, the unemployment rate is not rising as much as in the US. Uh, jobs are, are preserved for the time being. And um, I'm concerned that uh, uh, the US path uh, may not be uh, optimal you know, because jobs destruction, the millions of jobs that are being destroyed some of them will not be uh, recreated, you know, after the, the uh, pandemic is over and shutdown is over. And uh, I'm worried about the possibility that the recovery might be slower uh, in the U.S. than uh, in European countries or in uh, Canada, for instance. I want to make sure I understand, and we're going to come back to this later, Gabe. Let me just follow up here for a second. So what you're saying is that as a result, your assessment or your concern at the moment is that as the result of the U.S. approach, the damage being done by this crisis um, may not be transitory, it may be permanent? Or at least that it will take longer for the economy to fully recover once uh, shutdown is over. Because uh, uh, people are losing their jobs, you know, some of them will be recalled and uh, will start uh, working again uh, uh, for their former employer once the shutdown is over. But millions of workers will also remain unemployed maybe for weeks, for months, maybe for years, uh, while in countries that try to protect jobs, keeping workers on payroll, keeping workers formally employed, uh, it's possible that the recovery uh, will be faster. So Henry, I'm, I'm gonna ask you to weigh in on the same thing, what you're seeing, and, and but to 
add that layer of politics, the political economy, your specialty in terms of what you're seeing and what you're reading. Sure. I think what Gabe is really talking about here is the degree to which an economy is a giant jigsaw puzzle. And once it gets completed, it sits there and it does change a little bit over time, but it's a tremendous amount of matching of people with jobs and jobs with customers and on and, on and, and firms with customers and so forth. We've taken that jigsaw puzzle in the United States and we've shaken it up and it's going to be very hard to put together. The European approach has been more to try to keep the jigsaw puzzle in place by keeping people at their jobs. And to the degree we've shaken up the jigsaw puzzle, it's gonna be a really big job to put it back together. And that's gonna be a job of government trying to help. Uh, I'm sort of struck by two things with respect to government. Uh, on the one hand, I think it's really working hard to try to solve some of the problems, certainly in the public health field. It's been extraordinary, the leadership we've seen from CDC, the leadership and the, the governors, uh, really trying to have policies that'll solve that problem. Uh, then the other thing I'm, I'm struck by is how government now is going to incur enormous amounts of costs because of lost revenue and so forth. And in fact, it's going to come out of this weaker than it was before, when in fact we need a strong government and a government able to solve problems. So one of the things we have to face, and it was partly at issue yesterday, by the way, with respect to the bill that was in the Senate that didn't get passed, it was going to provide $250 million additional for the the program that provided money to small business. And the Democrats said, no, no, we also have to provide some money to state and local governments and to hospitals and other organizations, which are so essential to making this system work. And that's where it foundered because the Republicans at that moment, at least were unwilling to agree to that. So we've got to think about the fact that it's not just that we've shook up the jigsaw puzzle of jobs we've uh, in, in the private sector, we've shook up, shook, uh, shaken up uh, the jigsaw puzzle of government. Got it. Um, you know, there's, I think one of the things that's sort of characterizing this uh, moment of time that we're living in is uncertainty. Uncertainty about epidemiological progression, uncertainty about the economy. But let me hold your feet to the fire. In the course of your initial answers, I heard the word recession. I heard the word depression. Where do you, and we're going to go around again, and Jesse, I want to start with you. Where do you think we're headed right now? Something at Great Depression to sort of the depths of the Great Depression, the Great Recession from 2008, 2009, something in between or too soon to tell? What do you think, Jesse? So we're definitely headed for something as deep, much deeper than the Great Recession, comparable to the Great Depression in depth. What we don't know yet is whether we'll be able to bounce back quickly or whether it will linger on for a decade or, or the way the Great Recession did. Some of that has to do with the kinds of things that Gabriel was talking about, that, that the greater extent that we can keep workers attached to their firms and to keep the firms afloat, the more likely it is that we'll bounce back quickly. But really, this is an experiment in something we've never tried before. Uh, it's, oh, I, have, I manage a building on campus that has an old boiler. And in the, during the shutdowns, we never shut off the boiler because we're not confident we can turn it back on again. We've just shut down our economy and we hope it'll turn back on again and be just as good. But, but we, if you turn off an old machine, it breaks in various ways and we just don't know what it's gonna be like when we try to turn it back on. Hillary, what are you seeing? Recession, depression, uncertainty? I think it's too early to tell. I mean, everything Jesse said is exactly right. The analogy in the Great Recession is up in something like a bathtub. You know, we entered, we had a loss of jobs and, and we were kind of, it took a while to make our way out of that uh, recession. And the question now is, are we going to be in more of a V or are we going to be more in a very, very deep bathtub, deeper than the bathtub that we had in the Great Recession? And I would say that for me, the most optimistic thing I think I can say is that while Congress is not done with the policies to uh, aid with relief and then stimulus, it did move quickly relative to how fast Congress has moved in the past. And I think that continuing to move at that pace to keep up with the, the nature of the uh, situation that we're in is absolutely critical. So I think that's the most optimistic thing I can say. Laura? So I think um, one, one potential historical period to look to that hasn't been brought up uh, between the recession and the depression is World War II. And while we should be 
certainly very cautious in drawing analogies is very different situation. Um, that, that is another kind of moment of uh, extreme economic challenge that also showed surprising quick reversion back to the pre-war time economy uh, or even better in the post-war boom. So um, I do think there are other moments in time where we've had shocks this big and that's part of the advantage of being an economic historian is something that seems unprecedented uh, in recent history. Well, if you turn the clock back far enough, we've seen other times that governments and economies have responded to large shocks. So I want to push back at you a little bit. To me, as a layperson, it's actually, it seems very different from World War II. Mobilizing armies around the world required uptick in manufacturing. People were fully engaged, either on the front lines or on the home front. And whereas here, it seems like it's the exact opposite, a full shutdown. Where are you finding the similarities? No, it's an excellent point. And again, we should be cautious in uh, looking at that particular historical episode. Um, but one very clear analogy uh, or common you know, similarity is that the economy had to be redirected or wound down. So production for civilian consumption was turned down uh, to a bare minimum so as to redirect production towards the war effort. And so there is somewhat of an analogy to saying we need to shut everything down, we need everyone to stay at home to deal with the current crisis. Um, so actually there was a really great piece in Vox today on what lessons we can learn from World War II by Jillian Brunet, who's an economic historian at Wesleyan and Berkeley graduate. Um, so we can draw some lessons from, from this time period and I think the key thing to look at there is how aggressive uh, government policy was in terms of um, taking uh, control and sort of directing the economy during this time. And uh, that surely could be uh, used more today. Gabe, I'm gonna to turn to you again, again for the, uh, the global view. You don't have to be confined to that, but at least for um, this question, I'm wondering what you see globally. And I'm wondering if you think there may also be differences, some countries really heading into dire depression-like straits while others might do better. What do you, what's the initial data telling you? Uh, I think it's too soon to tell. Uh, this is a global crisis that's uh, evolving incredibly fast. Uh, it is huge. It is unprecedented. Uh, billions of people are on lockdown. This has never happened in the past. And so we need to be extremely uh, cautious uh, in terms of making uh, predictions about uh, how things might play out. There, there's fundamental uncertainty about the disease itself. How long is it going to take before uh, we get a va vaccine? Uh, uh, can people be uh, reinfected uh, once they got uh, COVID-19 uh, once? Uh, so many things that, uh, uh, that, that we don't know. Uh, and I, I totally agree with uh, Elora that in the end, what's going to be uh, essential is government government response you know the scale uh the uh the rapidity of uh, of the response and we've seen all countries uh move uh, all countries have moved very fast you know essentially not only the us but i think uh all developed uh countries have moved moved very fast with maybe the exception of uh, sweden which is following a different strategy uh, than other countries with, with very limited uh, lockdown. Uh, and so at the end of the day, it's what's going to, uh, to, to, to matter. So if we're, if we're clearly in an age, according to all of you, I think where government actions are really going to be the deciding factor here. Henry, talk to us a little bit about what you think about the government response so far. And I just have to say, trying to channel, again, the lay people who are watching all this, you know, my initial reaction was, oh, great, two and a half trillion dollars. And then my second reaction was two and a half trillion dollars. How bad is this? I mean, and then the Fed steps in with another two and a half trillion. And, you know, as they say, two and a half trillion here, two and a half trillion there. And you're almost talking about real money. Right. What, what's, what's happening and how do you assess the response so far? Well, just to note that it's a twenty two trillion dollar economy. So a $2 trillion stimulus bill, or actually initially it was really more like a protect the workers bill, uh, that's about 10% of the economy. Yet if you look at the data and, and others here have it 
more at hand than I do, but it looks like at least a third of the economy is shut down. So that 10% versus 33%, we're clearly not still doing enough, it would seem. And it may even be bigger than 33% of the economy shut down. So there's just a lot more that needs to be done. The big question here is whether the federal government uh, has the capacity to do that. There's some real limits. The Fed really can't lower interest rates a heck of a lot more. They can do some of what they're doing, which is to buy a lot of debt, which they are going to do, uh, and, but there's still even limits to that. Then also, there's just the question of how much deficit can the federal government absorb? Uh, um, the deficit was already heading towards a trillion dollars or more before the COVID epidemic. We're now probably headed towards a $3 trillion deficit and maybe more. And that's a lot. That's a very big deficit for the federal government. So it's not clear how much capacity they have there. Uh, and the state governments too are facing dire straits because they're going to have tremendous reductions in tax revenues. California will probably have a reduction in tax revenues on a total budget of about 200 billion. They'll probably have a reduction in tax revenues between 20 and $50 billion. Now the good news is there's a rainy day fund. And as of last November, that rainy day fund, including revenues that were uh, unspent, uh, was about $26, $27 billion. So part of that can be covered by the fact that Jerry Brown actually was quite thoughtful in making sure we had a rainy day fund. So good government actions are gonna make things better, um, but bad government actions like the fact that, for example, the federal government had a trillion dollar deficit already in good times, which most economists don't think is a good idea, that's gonna maybe lead to problems. So talking about good government actions, bad government actions, Hillary, I know a lot of your research and work um, focuses on the social sa on the safety net. Um, what's your assessment about the extent to which the federal government has taken that into account in terms of actions to date? And what else do you think needs to be done or will need to be done going forward in that regard for the most disadvantaged um, in our society? Well, if you look at the last, uh, the, the CARES Act, the phase three, as they're calling it in Washington, um, there are two very important elements uh, of the aid package for uh, ordinary uh, working Americans. And the first is the dramatic expansion of unemployment insurance, uh, which includes uh, a, a top up of $600 per week uh, for all unemployment uh, recipients uh, across the states. Um, and of course, um, that's going, that $600 is going to matter a lot more uh, for someone with a low wage than for someone with a high wage. So that's a very significant uh, element of the, of the aid to date. Uh, the second element that's important is the, di what was the direct payments that are included in the, in the Phase 3 Act, which includes $1,200 for uh, single adults or $2,400 for, for married couples. Uh, and so those two elements are sort of the strongest uh, elements of the, of the relief package to date. But when thinking about the most disadvantaged Americans, uh, there's, a, there's groups that are very left out by that assistance. To talk about the direct payments, the direct payments are being uh, uh, um, delivered uh, off of the databases from the tax, uh, federal tax records. So if you filed taxes in 2018, uh, which you would have done a year ago, or 2019, which some people would have done already today in early 2020, uh, then if you're eligible for the credit, uh, the payment, uh, you would receive that. But what we know is a dramatic uh, number of needy Americans are not filing taxes because they have more precarious low levels of earnings and are not required by law to submit taxes. And those individuals, while eligible for these direct payments, uh, have to go through the process of actually today filing taxes in order to uh, initiate those payments, which will not be received for many months. Um, and one very important thing that uh, we want to include in the next phase that is very targeted, very timely, uh, and very um, needy would be to expand benefits under the food stamp program or what's called SNAP nationally or CalFresh here in California. So I would say the two most important things on the top of my list that need to show up in the next 
set of congressional action are the three things are aid to states, that's already been mentioned uh, by Henry, uh, increasing benefits through this food stamp program, and number three, starting to address issues around rent uh, for uh, uh, the many, many uh, members of our society who are not getting helped by the advantages that are afforded to those uh, like many of us on this, uh, on this event who are owners. So Laura, in your, some of your opening comments, you also singled out a very specific community, the black community, um, where the impact of the crisis appears to be much greater. Why is the impact much greater? And what does it suggest in terms of the sort of governmental policies you think we should be thinking about right now? So yeah, so based on the data that we see coming out, uh, the numbers are astonishing in terms of disproportionate uh, mortality of uh, African Americans in cities like Chicago and Detroit. And I think what we're seeing in those cities is, in fact, the result of um, decades of local government decisions um, that have effectively, in many cities across the, the you know, in the Midwest, et cetera, prioritized investment in uh, police and the criminal justice system, as opposed to investments that they could have potentially made in public health and schools, uh, sanitation, and other infrastructure. And um, these cities have also faced, uh, due to kind of a historical legacy, persistent racial segregation. And we know that that's associated with uh, black children being more exposed to pollution and having higher rates of asthma, so there are these layers of um, both economic and health effects that act as, um, I like the use of, I've seen the use of this phrase of inequality as a comorbidity that's mm -hmm. worsening the impact of COVID-19 on black communities in particular. Uh, Jesse, let me turn to you here. Um, in terms of the economic policy responses, um, what do you think about what's been passed so far? What's missing? Yeah, so I think the, the, we, we keep calling the, the bills that have passed so far stimulus bills, but as Henry mentioned, that we, that's the wrong word for it. These aren't stimulus bills. These are keep people from drowning bills. And that's the right thing to be doing right now. Uh, the main thing that I think that's missing is that we have not been aggressive enough in making and getting testing capacity up in all the health interventions that would that would minimize the length of the shutdown. Of the shutdown. Uh, and so that's a huge, huge problem. Um, the any every every extra day that this lasts is costing us tens of billions of dollars of wealth that is just evaporating, and anything we can do to to get the health system ready to to allow us out of our homes uh, is worth doing. The next thing I would say is aid to states. There was some in the last bill, but not nearly enough for the for the shock they're hitting they're facing. They are the ones who have, will have to deliver a lot of the services that we'll need through this, and we need them to have the resources to do it. Um, the, there are other things that are missing that we weren't really able to put in. Um, we, as one theme that's come up in a lot of this discussion is that we, we came into this several steps behind other countries because our institutions weren't ready and our society wasn't ready to be able to, to do what we needed to do quickly. We didn't have programs in place that were very effective for helping firms keep workers on their payroll. Mm -hmm. We actually have, have programs like that in place, but they've been designed with the primary goal of making sure that no benefits go to anybody who doesn't need them, rather than making sure they're easy to scale when we do need them. And so that makes it hard to scale them. And we've seen that they don't scale very well. Um, similarly, our high levels of inequality have meant that, that we're, we've got large sections of our population that are really very vulnerable to this, and we, we don't have easy ways to fix that. Uh, but I think, the, the, in general, what we've done is pretty good relative to what we could do, given how badly prepared we were for it. Um, I, the, the main concern I have with what we've done so far is that the bills that have been passed all were, were written with an idea that we knew how long this was going to last. And so we're written with hard shutoffs so that, that, that we'll only provide eight weeks of support. But that means that every time that we extend how long this is going to last, we need to go back to Congress and get another thing through. And it's not easy to get things through Congress. So the main thing I would put into the next bill is triggers that, that make the, the, the funding last as long as it needs to, and to, to get us out of here. 
Then we'll need to come back with stimulus bills once we let people out of their houses. But for now, what we need is to make sure that these bills keep people afloat as long as we can. So let me ask any of you, I wanna, we're getting questions from the audience here through Facebook. Um, and I wanna make sure we bring some of those in because they're some really good questions related to what we're just talking about. Can we afford this? I mean, talking about trillions of dollars, understand that the national economy is 22 trillion, but we're heaping debt upon massive amounts of new debt on what was already a pretty high level of debt. Is it possible to bankrupt a country? Jesse, go ahead. Okay, we can afford this. Uh, you know, this is very costly. Every day that somebody doesn't go to work because they're not allowed out of their house is lost wealth that could they could be generating they're not generating. And that's lost for good and it won't ever come back. But the choice is, do we take that as a one third or more reduction in our consumption right now? Or do we spread that out over the next 20 or 30 years? Clearly the right answer is to spread that out. And so, and that's what taking on debt is. We can afford it as much as we need to, to make, to get through this. And I think all of the arguments that you might worry about debt being too high, they just don't apply to this kind of a situation. Gabe, I want to come back to you on the, the question of policy. Um, and again, if you don't mind, leverage your, your expertise in terms of the global situation. And you was something you alluded to earlier. Are there policies being enacted by other countries right now that you think we should be emulating that are adaptable and transportable into the American economic structure? Yes. So all countries, wealthy nations have universal health insurance, uh, the US doesn't. The US could have uh, universal coverage for COVID related care, you know, call it a COVID care for all program, a clear commitment by the federal government that no matter your employment status, no matter your immigration status, no matter your age, any healthcare related to the virus is going to be covered by the federal government. I think this would help a lot. There are 30 million Americans who are uninsured today. There will be more because many millions are losing their job today and used to get health insurance through their job. Uh, there are tens of millions of Americans who face very high deductibles, hmm. co-pays, and so who would have to pay quite a lot uh, to, to, uh, to get treated. Um, so uh, I think that's, that's one thing uh, that's missing in the, in the CARES Act. Basically, the government saying, look, we will cover all COVID-related care. We've, been, we've seen stories already of um, people who died because... Uh, they didn't seek treatment because they were worried about the cost. Uh, they didn't have insurance or sometimes they were denied care because they didn't have insurance. That's something that you only see in the U.S. and that's something that the next bill should uh, tackle. Anybody else? Yes, Hillary, go ahead. I wanted to mention that another, um, you know, Gabriel brings up some very important things that differentiate the United States from our other rich country uh, comparisons, like importantly and centrally universal health insurance. Another aspect that is that really is a is a predetermined um, feature of our social safety net that really becomes very clear in times of recession is that the United States has really built its assistance uh, system uh, on a kind of conditionality uh, that assumes that families must work in order to get the assistance that they may be eligible for through uh, providing assistance to low wage families through the earned income tax credit, which is like a, a top up to your earnings uh, rather than more unconditional assistance. And that is a very much a feature of the United States system that is not shared by other countries. And so is it surprising that if you build a social safety net that is based on the assumption of work, is it surprising that that doesn't do well in a time where we don't have work? It's not surprising at all. And it's something we talked a lot about in the context of the Great Recession. Yet if anything, policies have moved more towards adding these kind of work requirements and different kinds of uh, conditionalities 
to our basic level of assistance. So another way that the United States differs quite dramatically um, from other countries is just our base lower level of spending um, and spending that's targeting uh, rather than these situations when there is a war. Henry? Yeah, I just wanted to say, I, I think we can afford it and it's very important not to lose our uh, there's real evidence that um, when Franklin Delano Roosevelt came in, in in 1933, that he started to stimulate the economy. That helped. That brought uh, the level of unemployment down. And then, for a variety of political reasons, uh, the country lost its nerve and did less. And ultimately, it was only World War II that brought the country back. There's also evidence that we didn't do enough in 2008 and 2009, that we should have had another big stimulus bill after the first one. So I think the evidence is pretty clear that doing things big can really have an important long-term impact that will save us money in the long run and make this uh, a happier and better country than uh, losing our nerve. I'm going to go back to some, yeah, Gabe, go ahead, sorry. So just one thing on the uh, can we afford it question. I think people focus too much on the debt to GDP ratio and not enough on another ratio, which is actually uh, more meaningful, which is interest payments, government interest payments as a fraction of GDP or as a fraction of national income. And because interest rates on government debt are very low today, uh, government interest payments are actually at a historically low level. Mm -hmm. So from that perspective, we can absolutely afford to have ambitious uh, uh, an ambitious government response to uh, to this crisis. Yeah, Hillary, please. Just wanted to add one thing in, in case this is something that not everybody knows. States are, are, are not able to borrow. So many of us have mentioned the central importance of delivering aid from the federal government to the states and that that has, has not, has $150 billion, but we need a lot more for the states. The reason that that's so critical, Henry talks about uh, the situation in California and our projected decline in revenue. We can't borrow to make that up. And so that's where the federal government needs to come in and help states uh, get over this shock um, uh, because the alternative is dramatic cuts uh, to meet the balanced budget requirement. So I think we're gonna come back to this, we have time, but I do wanna take some more, get some more questions from the audience here. The first one, unfortunately, I think I could answer with my lowly BA in political science, but. I'll let you guys have a whack at it. And it's from one of our students. And the question is for graduating seniors in college and the classes below us, any guesses on how this will affect our job prospects? Somebody want to tackle that one? Jesse, Jesse should take Jesse. this one. <laughs> I've, I've been working on, the, on a study of the impact of the Great Recession on people who graduated during that time. And unfortunately, the news isn't good. The, the recessions are very bad for, for the outcomes of people who have to find jobs in them. And so, again, this is different from any other recession. And the more we can make sure that this is a V-shaped recovery, that we bounce right back, then the less damage this will do. If this lasts on for, goes on for years and years because we, we lose our nerve and we stop stop stimulating the economy is enough to get it back to, to where it needs to be, then that, that will have long-term consequences. Uh, it's now, one of the reasons why it's so important to do that, to, to act aggressively. Henry? Something like a federally funded internship program might be something worth thinking about. Something that would provide students with a bridge over the next six months to a year so that they get work experience. Because part of what Jesse's research shows is that what people lose who don't get into the job market after graduating is a rung of the ladder. They haven't been able to get up that first rung of the ladder, and therefore they're always one step behind everybody else. So if we could help them get up that first step, even if we're internships that were not paid maybe quite at the level that most uh, graduating students would like, but at least give them some experience and some money, that would be very, very useful. We're talking a lot about money and we've got a few view viewers who ask the same question. What about the poorer countries that don't have the kind of wealth for the sort of stimulus, the sort of supportive legislation we're talking about? Are we also looking at a, the possibility of a huge degree of global inequity and disparities? Anybody? 
Gabe, you want to take a shot at that one? Yes. Um, quickly, yes, we, uh, we, we are seeing that uh, emerging economies are hit uh, by the virus and are hit by a huge financial crisis at the same time, which is uh, the complete uh, collapse of uh, international capital flows. So uh, there, are not, there are massive outflows of money out of developing countries. Uh, governments in these countries are not in as good a position as government in the US or in Europe to borrow uh, money. And so there's going to be a need for uh, international solidarity to help developing countries uh, weather the storm. That's going to be extremely important. Yeah, Hillary, please. I think the other factor that's the public health factor that's layered on top of what Gabriel said is the fact that the, some of the most basic things that we all know are important for limiting the spread, washing our hands, is something that uh, the less developed countries simply do not have uh, in every household. And so that's going to make the spread of the virus much more difficult to, to contain. Although the one positive element, I was listening to an interview yesterday with Esther Duflo, uh, who won the Nobel, was part of the team that won the Nobel Prize this year for doing research in uh, less developed countries. And she was raising the point that many of these uh, very poor countries actually have a very sophisticated system of financial distribution infrastructure through cell phone banking that we actually don't uh, use uh, very dramatically in the United States that pre presents an opportunity uh, for doing uh, kind of relief uh, in a wide scale uh, and relatively low cost way. So that would be a, a bit of glimmer of hope in that setting if those resources are able to get there. So we're also getting a lot of questions from the audience that seem to be tapped into a debate that first started back 2008, 2009, 2010 and onward. And that was the extent to which the rescue package and all that was passed in, to address the challenges of the Great Recession, whether they were skewed more toward Main Street or more towards, uh, uh, towards Wall Street, and whether they actually accelerated um, inequities in the economy. Let me give you a, I'm going to give, just throw out a few related questions and ask each of you to take a bite at whatever sort of lands in your area of expertise. One question, there seems to be a large disconnect between Main Street struggling and Wall Street surging. What do stock investors know that everyone else doesn't? The entire, here's another one, the entire FY, uh, fiscal year federal budget is about 4.4 trillion. The COVID packages may exceed 5 trillion. How much of this is a massive wealth transfer to the largest corporations and high income individuals? So if you guys could just address that, what we're seeing, the Main Street, Wall Street, policies that may be about transfer of wealth. What are you seeing now? Where are our sources of hope and what are sources of concern for you? Alora, let me start with you. Yeah, I wanna bring back a point that Hillary raised earlier about this question of renters versus homeowners, uh, because I think it's, uh, it captures exactly this issue. Um, there, there is probably a sense that um, that large corporations are, that the government will help make them whole more so than quote unquote Main Street. And I think uh, this is why the issue of, we need to be talking about what about renters? Um, if we're talking about mortgage moratoriums, what about people who pay rent? What is going to stop the um, hemorrhaging of people who are no longer able to go to work in terms of their finances? And the um, I think the important uh, takeaway is that the more we invest in Main Street, the better a recovery we we would expect to have. Um, so if people leave this uh, current crisis more in debt, um, it's going to be really hard to sort of restart the economy and stimulate demand. Uh, so we should really be focusing our efforts on making people whole, on stopping the money that's flowing out. Um, and potentially just reducing the disparity even more than we might have done to, again, help in the recovery period. Okay. Yeah, I think, uh, of course, the concerns about the distributional impacts of the crisis and of government intervention are very legitimate. Um, and the best way to address those concerns, in my view, is through the tax system. So 
some comp some companies are are going to exploit loopholes in in government relief plans, for instance. Others are benefiting from the pandemic. Uh, Amazon sales are rising. Uh, the the manufacturers of of uh, ventilators of uh, uh, medical equipment are, are making uh, quite a lot of money. Uh, but these windfall gains, they have a fair and comprehensive solution, once, one that's been applied many times historically, which is to tax excess profits. Uh, you can define excess profits in many ways, you know, uh, but the idea is the, 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 the firms that are making, that are going to make much more profits in 2020 or 2021 as compared to 2019, 2018, these excess profits could be taxed at very high rates, at confiscatory tax rates, uh, just like the U.S. did uh, during World War I, uh, during World War II, during the Korean War. So these types of excess profits taxes are common in history during uh, periods of national crisis. And in my view, it's the most powerful way to address at least uh, you know, the, the windfall gains uh, that, that might occur during this crisis. Or to put, to put it differently, I think it's important to have money flowing out to businesses today, uh, including to large corporations. I don't, want, I don't think we want to be in a situation where uh, lots of businesses, small and big, uh, would have to liquidate uh, or would have to uh, uh, file for chapter 11. I think it's important to keep businesses alive during the crisis and the tax system then can make sure uh, that uh, nobody benefits uh, from, uh, from the pandemic. Let me ask you a question because I mean all of us, whether we're in, um, in the academy or not, we have our own political beliefs. We have things that we believe in and we advocate for. Um, and there have been some charges from both sides of the political spectrum that politicians and legislators are maybe following too closely the Rahm Emanuel dictum, never let a crisis going to waste, and are trying to load onto this crisis policy objectives that aren't actually directly related to what the crisis demands. Henry, do you think there's a danger of that? What's your assessment of the politics of this moment and the extent to which there maybe are some glimmers of significant bipartisanship? Well, the, the first uh, bill, the first $2 trillion bill, that wasn't actually the first in the series, but the, the really big one, that looked like bipartisan and that was good. It looks like that's already breaking down and we're seeing breakdowns too with respect to such things as how should we run elections uh, with uh, Mr. Trump uh, opposed to mail balloting, with Democrats pushing mail balloting. Uh, that's actually based partly, I think, on misconceptions on the part of Republicans who think they are necessarily disadvantaged by greater turnout that would occur or might occur uh, with respect to mail ballots. Uh, the, the research is actually not clear who benefits or who doesn't benefit. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, Mr. Trump, in a, in a rather remarkable statement, said that he thought that if the kinds of attempts the Democrats were making to improve the electoral voting system were made, that there'd never be a Republican elected again. I think that's false. And I'm sorry that he has that perspective. Uh, because in fact, right now, given the situation we're in, going to mail balloting makes a heck of a lot of sense. It could protect a lot of people. And furthermore, there's not really any significant evidence of fraud. And to the degree there are concerns about that, there are things we can do. So I guess I'm worried that um, unfortunately for short periods of time, we may get bipartisan approaches, but quickly that breaks down with each side having their own particular interests and trying to push those interests. I wish at least their interests were based upon knowledge about what the facts are with respect to whether or not the policy is good or bad for them. And in the mail ballot approach, I think that basically uh, Mr. Trump is not completely informed. Jesse, I'm gonna ask you this sort of the same question, what you think of the politics of the moment, because certainly we saw a number of legislators from the conservative side of the political spectrum voting for things that looked like a lot like a guaranteed income, direct payments, things that you know would have been anathema not that long ago. What's your take? So I think I unusually have a glass half full perspective on this, uh, at least so far. <laughs> I think that we've, that we've done a pretty good job of putting together the best package we could put together uh, and putting aside partisan disagreements. 
you know, maybe it took 12 hours longer to pass that last stimulus because of, of squabbling in Congress than it, than it would have if everybody had just agreed. But we did pretty well and we passed an enormous bill very quickly and it's pretty good. Uh, one of my concerns about the fact that it had the, has these fixed phase out times in it and the need to go back is that I worry that that spirit is not gonna last very long. And so I wanna make sure that we put things in place that will take us through this crisis while we still can. Um, and uh, we're already seeing it breaking down some, but I think thus far the policy responses have been what we'd want them to be. Uh, you know, I wouldn't say the White House has necessarily been helpful in getting us there, but but the but Congress has has gotten its act together. The yet another unexpected and unanticipated, unanticipated development here: people's having kind words about Congress, which is the recording has stopped. Um, We've had a number of questions from viewers about undocumented workers. Um, I'm not sure if this falls into anybody's bailiwick, but there's a lot of concern being expressed about what's happening to that community, that population, what politically acceptable approaches there may be to keeping these people alive. Let me just open that up and see if anyone on this particular panel has anything to add, anything to tell people who are concerned about the undocumented people who are living in the country right now. Hillary, please. Well, I mean, what, what you see, there's some feedback there, okay. Um, what you see is that, uh, you know, the American social safety net, such as it is, subject to the limitations that we talked about earlier, is one where your documentation status is, is a very critical element. So the undocumented population, uh, is not eligible for many of the benefits and uh, protections that we've talked about today. I mean, the thing that I would point out, particularly on the public health side, um, is that California has been a more aggressive about dedicating public funds to expand eligibility uh, for Medicaid or Medi-Cal to the undocumented population, uh, paying out of our own state funds uh, rather than with federal matching funds. We're not all the way there. Um, and there's a lot of people talking about now is the time to go further, uh, you know, kind of a backdoor way to, to one element of what Gabriel had mentioned earlier about the importance of covering um, the benefit, the, the health care costs uh, for those that incur uh, 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 expenses due to the COVID-19. Anybody else who has something to add to or to help address the question about the fate of undocumented people in the country right now? Well, I, I would just say that this is a moment when we realize that we're all in this together. And one hopes that uh, there's some reflection upon that fact and a recognition that as a society, we really have to think about everybody uh, and sometimes get beyond what some of our prejudices might be one way or the other, uh, because we really are all in this together. And as Hillary has shown in a lot of her work, it turns out that when we do good things for people, like providing uh, children with food stamps, uh, they turn out to have better lives as they go forward. And the society is better because of the better lives that those children have been allowed to have. And so I think we have to think about how by investing in people, we actually make the society better and we're just a better place. Laura, speaking of disadvantaged communities or in sort of circling back to the broader theme of disparities, I want to ask you about service and retail employees. I mean, many of them work in businesses that have now been deemed essential. Um, and these are the same people who have faced stagnating wages and declining protection from labor law. Um, you think there's a possibility that these workers are, can gain concessions from employers that might be long lasting? Could this for, is there a possibility of lasting change for this particular sector of our labor market? I really do think the current moment is a flashpoint or a watershed moment with respect to workers in uh, services, transportation, retail, these sectors that have uh, become, at, they're now frontline workers, essential workers. Um, but it really depends on what choices are made both by policymakers and, and uh, what worker organizations are able to do. So just yesterday, Unite Here, which is the large union that represents hotel and restaurant employees, announced that 98% of their 300,000 plus workers are out of work. Um, so at a moment where we already had about 7% of 
private sector workers uh, having union coverage and, and union membership. I don't know if we come out of this with close to you know two percent or zero or or whatever it may be. So this is a moment where we really have to rethink um, how workers are protected. So although these workers are in this unique position of being considered essential and from that perspective ought to have some additional bargaining, bargaining power over uh, protective equipment, hazard pay, et cetera, at the same time, unemployment is 17 million. So this is a place where I think government policy is actually really critical in terms of protecting workers and protecting their ability to, uh, to organize, which is going to take unusual forms now because unions are um, not as big a player. So one example is um, I, I do know some uh, members of Congress sent a letter to Amazon inquiring about their firing of an employee who organized a, a protest over safety. So actions like this that indicate that the government is going to step in on behalf of workers when they take these actions, that's that's really important. All right. So we only have a few minutes left, and I want to ask each of you, and, and if we can keep it tight, about a central conundrum. I mean, that is which I've read in a number of places. If we open up the economy, and I think believe, uh, even today, the president is starting to talk about opening up the economy or beginning to come back in May. But the conundrum is if we open up the economy too soon, could lead to mass deaths or additional mass deaths, deaths that many might see as unnecessary and avoidable. But if we keep the economy shut down for too long, we can produce mass suffering. Is there a false choice between saving lives and the economy? How do you think about this? How should we think about this? Gabe, let me start with you. I think it's mostly a false choice. Uh, there is uh, no way to uh, reopen the economy without controlling the, the outbreak of the virus. So the economy will reopen only once the outbreak is uh, controlled. I think most economists agree with that and so that this trade-off doesn't really exist. Uh, controlling the, the outbreak, uh, shut down today, lockdown today is what's good for the economy, what, what will enable the economy to, uh, to reopen and to recover quickly. Jesse? The only thing I would add to that is that when, when economists worry about trade-offs, the first thing you look at are, are there ways to push out the frontier. Hmm. And the way that we can push out the frontier here is by really taking seriously the public health side of things, investing in protective equipment, investing in ventilators, investing in hospital capacity and in testing. And I, I think we have not had enough focus on that for our national leadership. And I think it's put us behind where we could be. And we really need to make sure we do everything we possibly can to speed all of that up. Hillary, what about the trade-offs? I attended a conference yesterday, a virtual conference of macroeconomists who were presenting models of the combination of the, of the public health piece and the economic piece and the interactions. And it's very clear that there is not a trade-off. So in a word, yes, it, it, you know, it, is, it is a false choice that's being presented. Um, and the one thing that I would add to um, what Jesse actually just said is I think we, in addition to the investments that Jesse talked about that we're behind on and need to move on. What we also face is an exit strategy. Um, and so we need to have a plan in place for figuring out a way to safely move away from shelter in place. And it seems very clear it's going to require a lot of testing um, and antibody tests to figure out who has already been exposed. Laura? So, yeah, I think. I'm not even sure the language of trade-offs is really appropriate at all. One perhaps better way to frame this is that we have the binding constraint of minimizing deaths from this pandemic. And given that we are shutting down the economy and um, you know, as Keynes actually wrote talking about uh, World War II, we in a free society need to think about how we distribute the pie that's now fixed um, given the constraint of addressing the pandemic. And how we distribute that pie is going to determine the path, the exit strategy as well. Henry, you're the dean. Dean always gets the last word. Well, I want to talk about the future. I think the politics of the future is going to do, I hope, uh, deal with the question of resiliency. I think we've built an economy that's a Ferrari and certain, some people can afford Ferraris and others can't. 
I don't know. It's a great car. I don't think, in fact, it is a great car for family <laughs> around. Um, and we've got to build a society that carts the whole family around. And it's got to be a resilient society. And we have to recognize that, in fact, by becoming more equal and more concerned with everybody, we will be more resilient and we'll have a great vehicle for family outings, although maybe not for the racetrack. So I really, I want to thank all of you for what has been an incredibly provocative and informative conversation. I think it's clear why the Golden School of Public Policy is one of our nation's finest. Um, so thank you all very thank much. You. And for all of you, I want to say that next up in this Berkeley Conversation Series, our School of Public Health will be hosting a virtual town hall. The program is called Coronavirus Science and Solutions. It will focus on addressing questions from the audience and exploring the emerging science that will drive solutions not only to this pandemic, but future outbreaks. I hope you'll be able to join us at 4.30 p.m. Pacific on Monday, April 13th. And in the meantime, be well, stay safe, and be sure to keep your distance. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thank you.